Tonight, we welcome Kevin Wells to talk about the priests we need to save the church. Kevin Wells is a former Major League Baseball writer, award-winning journalist, and author of First, A Story of God's Grace When Life Falls Apart. His latest book, The Priests We Need to Save the Church, is on its fourth printing and has been one of America's best-selling Catholic books since its August 2019 release. Kevin's written plea for priestly heroism and holiness has been read by many hundreds of seminarians, priests, and bishops throughout the world. Some bishops, such as His Excellency Joseph Strickland of Tyler, Texas, have purchased cartons of Kevin's book and given them to each priest in his diocese. Vocation directors and seminary rectors have done the same. Kevin's an active freelance writer and Catholic evangelist who speaks on a variety of Catholic topics and sacred heirlooms. He is president of the Monsignor Thomas Wells Society for Vocations, which financially and prayerfully commits itself to the promotion of strong priests and seminarians and to the practice of the fullness of the Catholic faith. The society honors his celebrated uncle, who before he was murdered in his Maryland rectory in the year 2000, impacted the lives of many thousands of people throughout the Archdiocese of Washington. Kevin's work with youth earned him the James Cardinal Hickey National Figure Award from the Archdiocese of Washington, D.C. Kevin lives in Millersville, Maryland with his wife and his three children. He loves baseball, reading, and his backyard fire pit, oftentimes surrounded with many men gathered around. Without further ado, I give you Kevin Wells. Gentlemen, it's an honor uh, to be with you tonight. I, as I told as I told Mike, it's a darn shame that I'm not with you. Uh, West Coast of Florida is my spot. It's my stomping grounds. I lived on St. Pete Beach for a number of years, covered the Tampa Bay Rays that maybe you've discussed earlier. Um, baseball is my sport. Um, by the way, as an apology, after we're done this talk this evening, a, a, a complimentary autographed book goes to the gentleman who can tell me who the Rays starting infield was on opening day in 1998. So I'll let you stew on that and uh, no Google checking. Uh, and so so work, work, work the baseball mind right now. And uh, Blake Snell was brilliant to watch last night. So, so gentlemen, I, I don't know what's been shared by Mike or anyone about me. I was lucky enough to get with uh, Don last night on a podcast, but I have written a book entitled The Priests We Need to Save the Church. And I figured what we do tonight, uh, as you all know, things are, uh, things are pretty nutty out there right now. Things are um, unsettled, let's say, in the Catholic world. And, and I think it's time for candor in American Catholicism. Um, so uh, we'll, uh, before we get too candid about things, I, I, do, I would like to sort of start with a story and the story will explain what sort of led to my book. It's what a holy priest can do in our lives to sort of set our lives uh, on the path of sainthood and what a priest who sort of disobeys the burden of his identity to be a shepherd, what he can do to sort of set our lives and maybe even our marriage and families in flame. So with that said, I, I, I'd like to start, gentlemen, with uh, a story of what happened last year this month. Uh, I received a phone call from Bishop Joseph Strickland down in Tyler, Texas. And he had read my book and said, hey, Kevin, I'd like, I'd like to uh, somehow get together with you. It turned out I was going to Texas uh, a month later. So we ended up meeting in his diocese, the southernmost parish in his diocese. He drove two hours south and I drove two hours north from Houston. And it was a beautiful day, kind of like today, blue skies. And we sat down outdoors. And he said, hey, Kevin, I want to I want to tell you. Um, I want to tell you about sort of what happened when I first became bishop of Tyler, Texas. You know, it's about seven years ago, and, and a few people came up to me and they said something in, in this regard. You know, Bishop Strickland, we're glad to have you here down in Tyler, Texas. You're a good new bishop. We're proud of you. You're all, you're like a tall, cool glass of water. And that makes us feel good. And that made Bishop Strickland feel pretty good too, is what he told me anyway. And then a couple of years went by 
And then somebody handed him a book in 2017. The name of the book was Insenu Hesu. And the book was written by an, I guess, an anonymous Benedictine monk that over and over and over again in the holy hour, Christ had told him interiorly, sort of an interlocution. He said, tell my priests that I am heartbroken, that nobody visits me in the blessed sacrament. I am here waiting on them, and my priests do not come to see me. Tell them that I want them around me. Bishop Strickland read this book, and he said, shame, shame on me. He picked up this tall, cold glass of water, and he threw it on the ground, he said. And he said, for now on, I will be a chalice of the choicest blood of Christ. And what had happened when he started to go to daily holy hours, which is all he does now every day, is he started to be led not by Jesus, but he started to be led by Mary, the Blessed Mother, who told him very clearly, Joseph, I want you to be a martyr now for my son in the church. And you know me, I, I said, well, Bishop Strickland, your excellency, what, is it, what does that mean? What do, you, what do you mean a martyr for the church? I mean, what, what, is, what is a lot of definitions of that? He said, Kevin, you know, I, I think Mary would like me to, 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 to suffer and be a martyr for the church. I said, white martyr, red martyr, what do you mean? Mary would like me to die for the Catholic church today. So I, I, I introduced this story to my talk to say that I do believe, gentlemen of Fort Myers, whether you're down there or up here in D.C., that it is a time, um, prudentially, it is a time that all of us need to look at things differently, um, whatever it demands of us, whether it's, whether it's playing, praying a daily rosary, we've never done it, whether it's fasting, whether it's um, uh, any kind of mortification or a sense of asceticism we want to sort of take into our lives. I, I do believe it's a time where Bishop Strickland's words certainly emanate or resonate for me. Um, I need to do more for the suffering church now. We're not going to get into sort of what's floating around, what, what popped yesterday about Pope Francis and what was said about um, same-sex marriage and um, and, you know, uh, you know we, we know that there's a presidential candidate who's a Catholic tonight, who is running for office, who has married two men, who two weeks ago, he said on national TV that an eight-year-old could decide her, his or her gender, who is married, who's spoken about abortion in very graphic terms, and he's sort of putting himself out there as a faithful Catholic. But what I say is we should not dwell on that overly. We should not dwell on what's going to coming out of the Vatican. We should dwell right now on becoming holy men of God. I need to dwell on that for my wife and for my family. I can go on and on and on about things going on out there. And sometimes I'd like to, but I got to become holy. So anyway, here's what, here's what priests, holy priests can do for us. I met a woman named Krista Strollo in Florida, Lakeland, Florida. You guys know Lakeland. In 1996, she told me in a parking lot outside of a Bennigan's that she was Catholic. And I was living in the Bible Belt, not a lot of Catholics over there, that she was Catholic that she was Italian, her family owned the two Italian restaurants in town, and that she loved horses. And I like to go to the racetrack. I used to be Tampa Bay Downs horse racing rider. So it was bar, bar, bar. So two days later, we met for mass. It was our first date. Afterwards, after mass, we went to some greasy spoon. And she told me, Kevin, you know, one day, I don't know why she did, but she said, one day I'd like to have 10 children. And I'm from a family of 10. So I said, you know what, this, this thing might work. So we were married a year and a half later, went off to Tuscany, plinked glasses of Chianti uh, on a mountainside, and we said, here's to our family of 10. Three or four months later, we got home to St. Pete Beach, Florida, 
right there on the Gulf of Mexico. And we found that we could have no kids. God didn't bless us that way. And it was a guillotine to our marriage. It was a guillotine to our marriage because of what happened. My wife was the youth minister at our parish, St. John Vianney in St. Pete Beach, Florida. And she approached her boss, who was the pastor of the church. And she said, my, uh, Father, um, a horror has entered into our marriage. We just found out that without the aid of in vitro fertilization, we probably will not be able to conceive. The response was, well, if your consciences are settled and embryos will not be aborted in the womb, then in vitro fertilization is permissible. Uh, no, it's not permissible. I thank God I was raised in a family where my parents, my mom and dad tried, tried to raise me to understand sort of moral law, God's natural laws, the magisterium. And I did know that it was an unnatural way of bringing life into the world. So the very thing a priest is meant to do is sort of take a married, newly married couple that has a blue whale sized cross is to ask them to unite that cross with Jesus Christ and Golgotha. Instead, he injected a lie into our marriage. It got very dark. Three, four months into our marriage, it got very dark. It's like these seagulls that used to fly over our little place on the beach. They all of a sudden felt like demons. You know, she went in the Hatfield group and I was a McCoy. When I went in another room, she was happy. When she went in another room, I was pretty darn happy. I wanted to adopt. She wanted to feel the baby in her womb. And she wasn't budging and neither was I because a priest had told us that something impermissible was permissible. Great way to start your marriage. Great honeymoon. So what do you do? I asked Krista one day. I said, honey, we, gotta, we, we, we need help. This is getting worse. It's spiraling in a worse direction. We gotta, will you come back with me to Maryland, to my hometown? And she said, you know, why not? Nothing else is really working here. I, I, so got a U-Haul. We packed our back of our U-Haul. I quit my sports writing job with the Tampa Tribune. She quit her job riding horses and working at the parish. And we took the loneliest I-95 northbound trip ever taken. And we parked our car in Bowie, Maryland. We unpacked the infertility too. That didn't go away. I kind of figured stupidly that, um, you know, family and friends and the welcome embrace would be like, ah, you know, it's going to be better. Kevin's back in town, you know, it'll, but it, it just got worse. Krista used to cry herself to sleep at night and she wouldn't let me touch her because I was the enemy. The newly married couple can't stand each other. So what happens? My uncle, Monsignor Thomas Wells, if you line up 100 priests in a row in Washington, D.C. today, and you ask them which priest stood on truth, perhaps more than any other priest in the past 50 years in the diocese, maybe 8590 would say Monsignor Thomas Wells. Which one had the most joy? 8590, Tom Wells. Which one loved the Eucharist and spent time in front of the Blessed Sacrament maybe more than any other priest. Well, Tom Wells. Tom Wells was my uncle. I spent my life in his shadow. I traveled the world with him. Went to Ireland a few times with him. Monta drove out to Montana. Uh, used to ski with him up, up in Maine and New Hampshire. I kept him away from my family, my aching family, because I knew it was going to be two against one. But it was sickening in our marriage. <laughs> Those seagulls, those demons just kind of flew up to Maryland and they were just, they felt like they were just circling, looking at marital roadkill, just waiting for us just to fall apart. And I felt like it was going to happen. So I called him up one day in Beltway traffic, which, what I was stuck in today. And uh, I said, hey, Tommy, man, it, it's, a, it's a stinking mess. He said, I know all about it. He said, come over tonight. I said, all right, I'll be there right after work. Let me just clean up. I'll be there like seven o'clock tonight. He said, you, you got to bring Krista. I said, she's not going to come. And I don't want her to come. He said, Kevin, you got to bring Krista. I said, I'll try. I, I, you know, no promises. So I went home. I said, Krista, I'm going over Tommy's tonight. 
I've held off for about five months here. We got to see him. And I open up the passenger side door, not knowing if she'd get in. And my God, I had never loved her more. She got in. We took a silent hour long ride out to Germantown, Maryland. <laughs> I was parking the car. He was on the back deck of his small rectory. It was a beautiful night. It was June 6, 2000. Beautiful night. And I was parking my car. I looked up at him and I saw him up there and he was looking at me in that way that he looked at me a thousand times before he was just shaking his head. And he had that Irish smile and those Irish eyes. And he was like, buddy, just shut it down tonight. You don't say a word. Just shut it down. Just, just. So we went up to his rectory. I uh, always remember Tommy put out his arms to give Krista a hug. I don't know if he expected a a warm hug, but he didn't get one from her. And what he proceeded to do, I think what I'll do right now is I'll tell you how he began to change things. If you'll indulge me right now, I'm going to read a little bit from the book, just a little bit. So the colors of the summer sky were just beginning to deepen. He looked at me quickly. Then he turned his focus and his attention to Krista and he clucked his tongue. In that way of his, he studied her hazel eyes and he shook his head slowly, a movement that looked like, no, nah, but actually meant, yeah, I get it. He curled his tongue into a corner of his mouth and he focused on her face. He kept still in what seemed a genuflection to Krista's brokenness. Then he smiled. When he finally spoke, he sprang. It's God awful, Krista. I know it is. It's God awful. Krista's icy facade broke and tears came at once and Tommy's eyes went watery, though he kept smiling. He seemed to know something that we didn't and he kept shaking his head. Then he turned our world upside down. You guys have no idea how lucky you are. You've got no idea, do you? He picked you two. He picked you two to carry his cross. Jesus chose you. He's asking you to carry it with him. In a sentence or two, he brought us to Golgotha, to the foot of the cross, where for the first time in months, a pinhole of illuminative light shone through. Tommy's words could have seemed ridiculous, cruel even, but the surge of warmth that we felt told us that there was order in them. He sensed a sudden opening in our wound, so he stepped further into it, enlightening us on the inside-out, illogical way of God's love. For months, we had found our cross of infertility revolting and unbearable, a blanket of thorns. Tommy insisted on telling us that what we regarded as diminishment was actually pure gift. Of course it's miserable. I know it is, guys, but you got to see this. There's so much goodness to it. He had straightforward opinions and a zeal for untangling problems by rolling out the cashmere blanket of Catholic truths. This storehouse of dogma and doctrine sanctified by time and lived out by saints sparked the countless leaps that he had taken into souls down the years. Tommy proposed to us that even within God's mysterious plan for our marriage, and its seemingly permanent childlessness, that we should bend our will entirely to his. This was the mystery of the cross. Christ's love subsumed all heartbreak, rage, and desolation, and gave it inexorable purpose. Walling ourselves off in a catacomb of self-pity, it served no purpose, and we cave in, in on us eventually anyway. Tommy encouraged us to set blister-shouldered Simon free to beat back the long path to Cyrene. It was our time now to bear the full weight of the cross, our opportunity to resign ourselves to God's mysterious plan. He didn't soften the ground for us. He asked that we walk it like saints. Then Tommy said the unsayable. Infertility was the complete measure of God's love poured out into us. How in the world does anyone say that? How does somebody say the, the biggest cross for lives is the greatest gift of our lives? He said, Kevin, Krista, 
I know your sister's pregnant. I know your neighbor's pregnant. I know your nieces are pregnant. You're from a big family. All you see is pregnant girls all over the place and you can't have any kids. You guys are in a cave and you're on the floor and it's dark and it's nasty and you are alone. But I promise you this, trust him now. Look for that pinhole of light in the cave and walk towards it and trust him with this strange providence of your infertility. I promise if you trust him, that he will give you gifts in your marriage that you can't conceive of. You're about to open and start the most intimate friendship with God than you could ever imagine. He had broken open an omnibus on Catholic suffering. He told us how to embrace, not shoulder, but embrace the cross. Two days later in that same rectory, Tommy was murdered. A homeless man, high on drugs and cocaine, broke into his rectory and stabbed him to death. And what the assistant state attorney said was the most grotesque murder scene that she had ever walked into. Tommy at the time was considered um, <laughs> sort of a, a giant, a paragon in Washington, DC. He was the troubleshooter of the Cardinal. If there was a parish with scandal, uh, there was a scandal at a parish, Cardinal Hickey would say, hey, they're too wealthy over there. They need to be settled down. Tommy, go over here. Hey, Tommy, you know what? They're, they're falling out of the parish because something had happened with a former priest. You got to go. Hey, Tommy, this parish is poor. They need a lift. You got to go. He was a troubleshooter. When he was murdered, 3,500 people showed up at his funeral and 250 priests and deacons because he had been to so many parishes. It seemed that, that this this shifting shadow of evil had sort of like a, an invisible poisonous gas had sort of settled over Maryland because one of the strongest powers for good in this area was grotesquely murdered. And selfishly, I lost, Crystal lost her newfound shepherd. Mm. I didn't know if she'd buy in or not because she wasn't speaking. A day after the funeral, she came up to me, hugged me, looked me in the eyes and said, Kevin, I have no idea how I'm going to do this, but what he said made sense. I'm going to take this newborn baby ghost that I can't have, and I'm going to die to it. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I want to walk with Christ and see where he's going to take us. Let's adopt. No words, just no words. Krista bought, Krista bought in. So what happens? Life goes on. It's horrible, but life goes on and life gets pretty good. Work is good. You know, you live life. Adopted three children, Gabrielle, Sean, and Shannon. Work was really busy. Um, December of 2009, nine years later after the murder, I was at the Loyola Retreat House over here in Maryland, a beautiful retreat house. sits way up on a cliffside that overlooks the Potomac River. And um, I had been there for maybe the 20th year in a row, the same weekend, uh, the same retreat, you know, just the same old thing. Good stuff, right? I go every year. This week, this weekend, I had just turned 40 years old, and wherever I went was this pricking awareness that I was not getting it done as a Catholic man. I wasn't loving my wife and kids well enough. There was this element of sloth that had sort of entered in my life. I, you know, there was areas of too much pride or whatever. I wasn't, I guess, sinning mortally too much. I mean, it wasn't like that, but I just saw that I wasn't living up to the measure of what God, I think, wanted out of me. And no matter what I did, no matter where I went that entire weekend, confession, a spiritual talk, maybe a holy hour at two in the morning, was this poking awareness that you are not getting it done as a Catholic man. So I have this thing I do every year around midnight. I go down to this dock. I walk way down this hill and go to this dock on the water on the Potomac River. And it was in the teens. It was like 18, 19, 20 degrees. It was very windy that night. And there was a full moon. And it's, it's in this location where you can see the Milky Way, because it's in the countryside. And, and this full moon was 
was like God's sort of swinging lantern of justice, just kind of back and forth. Like, yeah, what do you got? <laughs> what do you got? You come here every year and you sort of, you're like Paul on way to Damascus or Peter post Pentecost. And you have all these great resolutions. You did it last year and the year before, and you did it the year before. And what do you got this year? And it was almost like God was sitting on a stool, like a watchman looking down into my soul, stroking his beard. It's like, what do you got? What do you got? And the jig was up. And I knew it. And something happened, something came to me, and it had to be the Holy Spirit. I don't know what else it is, but it was this. God, you sent your son into the world to redeem us all through an act of violence. God, I, I, don't, I don't know. Maybe, maybe that's what I need. Maybe I need to be sent to the ground. And God, I ask you for violence. If there's going to be a redemption in my own life, you know, make it violent. And I knelt down on the dock that night. And I remember the, the sort of the waves sort of slapping up against the dock. And this warmth sort of encompassed me. And I said, this is good. My parents had taught me that when you walk into sort of this, this wilderness of consequence, when you make this kind of prayer, that it's going to be answered. And I knew, I don't know how the violence would come. I didn't know how like God would, you know, implement it, but whether it was psychological or emotional or physical, it was going to come. And I knew, I think the warmth was on the other end of it, that somehow through his graces, I was going to start to grow. I was going to start to become the man sort of that, you know, I needed to be. A month later, almost to the exact ticking second, it felt like somebody had thrown a tomahawk into the back of my skull. I had a brain aneurysm. Many people die instantly with what I had. It's called an arteriovenous malformation, where you're a, sort of a nest of blood vessels that's malformed just kind of pops and starts to drown your brain. Thank God Krista called 911. I was at a Baltimore hospital an hour later and nothing was working. They couldn't sort of stop the flow of blood. The shunts, they kept sticking in my head. They're all in my head. They kept clogging. They were threading sort of a tube up into my skull through my groin to try and embolize it, to try and glue the blood, but that wasn't working. Um, I guess it was like the fourth day and I was in an MRI tube for the second or third time where they were charting the blood and they had stuck this contrast into my body so they can get a better look in there. And when I was in this tube, I started to vomit. I had a reaction to the contrast and I couldn't tell the nurses that I was choking on my vomit because the, the brain injury had rendered my speech obsolete and I couldn't move my body. So what came to me was, okay, so, so this God is your plan for my end. This is how I'm going to die. And I don't know about you guys, <laughs> but I, I'm going to tell you because I was this close. I'm going to tell you what went through my head. Not a whole lot. The whoppers of sins of my past was not going through my head. And I thought I was going to die. What was going through my head was this. You didn't love well enough. <laughs> you just didn't love well enough. And I thought, man, I'm going to be sitting across from him in about a minute, maybe five minutes. Maybe I'll make it out of this somehow. But, but that's, I'm not going to be doing He's not going to be doing a lot of talking. I think it's going to be about me saying why I didn't love well enough because my conscience is clear. I didn't. The truest measure of love is sacrifice. I wasn't sacrificing enough. The little things, the big things, it didn't matter. I swallowed down the vomit because I wasn't eating anyway. That was kind of easy to do. When I survived the night, the next day they gave me invasive brain surgery. What they had tried, they wanted to avoid doing because the the malformation was too deep in my brain. They were in there for the whole day. And the surgeon pulled out and told my wife, we can't go any further. If we do, he's going to die or be changed forever. So this was the day for me to die. Um, Krista, God bless her, had heard of a man, of a priest named Father Jim Stack. Father Jim Stack was my uncle Monsignor Tom Wells' best friend. They did everything together. That was his wingman. They were wingmen. Father Jim Stack 
when Tommy was murdered, fell into a depression because two days before my uncle was murdered, Father Stack's father died. So he lost his two best friends in the span of 72 hours. Everyone knew that Father Stack, Tommy called him Stack Man. Everyone knew that Stack Man was depressed. Everyone knew that he looked different on the altar. He looked checked out, looked like he didn't want to be there. Everyone knew it. Stack knew it. The devil kept dropping the hammer on him saying, you're not a good priest. You're only good because of Tommy. You hate your priesthood. Your homilies are no good. You don't believe in the Eucharist anymore. It's a piece of bread to you. Just give it up. You stink. And I, and I say this because Father Stack would tell you this. This went on for years. Last ditch effort, he went down to Guadalupe and I won't go, it's a, this is an hour long talk, what happened to Guadalupe, but he, I'll just say he had a supernatural event happen to him down there. At the top of the Tepeyac Hill, Mary had said, Jim, um, you are now to heal people. You are to be a priest of anointing. He went back to his parish in Maryland, and that's what he started to do. And he started to gain renown throughout the Eastern Seaboard. Then he got the phone call from my wife, Krista. Father Stack, you got to get up here. Kevin's dying. I'll be there in an hour. And if he was looking at you right now on this camera, here's what he would tell you. If, if, if it was him and not me, here's what happened. He and his healing assistant, Mary Pat Donna, who came into my neuro ICU room on the seventh floor, and he knelt down by my bedside and he said, hey, Kevin, we've been praying the divine chaplet on the way to the hospital and calling on all the saints, the Maryland saints and the America saints, Mother, Anth Mother Mary Lang, John Newman, Elizabeth Ann Seton, Damien Amalekai. This is when saints can intercede. Is there a saint that can intercede for you now? I was incapacitated the entire day. I had nothing. I was out of it. What he said happened was I opened my eyes and I said, bring Tommy down. I need my uncle now. You know, it's a V8 moment for him. He stands up and is like, of course, of course. So if he was looking at you right now on this camera, here's what happened. He went to the foot of my bed and he said, hey, Tommy, your nephew Keggy just asked you to save his life. You got to ask God to save him now. And thereafter, the entire temperature of the room went from a cold, sort of an antiseptic ICU cold to a coaxing, all-encompassing warmth. His assistant almost fainted. She grabbed the bed. It was almost like a warmth where you're in, the, where, where it's 30 degrees and you sit by a fireplace in the wintertime and it feels nice and warm. And then lights started to pop all over the room. Mary Pat saw it. Father Stack saw it. And they both, they both knew they were standing in front of the supernatural. And Father Stack said, Kevin, I, I knew what was happening, but here's when I knew it was a miracle. As I was praying over you and calling on Tommy, I saw what seemed the heavenly court surrounding your bed and Tommy was standing next to me. This is what he would tell you guys. This is just, I'm just like a third party guy who was out of it, incapacitated. Here's what he would tell you. He said, I knew you were healed. I know what Chris had told me. I knew, I heard what the surgeon said. The next day they put me in the MRI tube and everything was gone. The blood, the fluids, the arterial venous malformation, everything was gone. So God had kept his promise. He made it violent. So now it was up to me, right? So I don't know what happens to other people when they're this close to dying, but here's what happened to me. Strangely, I mean, you don't force these things. They just kind of happen. Um, God's love story kind of began in my life. As I, used, I was a masonry contractor for a family business, and I was at job sites all day long, all over D.C., Northern Virginia, all over the place. And I stopped seeing superintendents and architects and bricklayers. I stopped seeing them as bodies. And I started in a weird, in a strange way that it'd be hard to explain that I'd see, I'd see them as souls. And I would address their souls when I spoke to them. I can't get into it, explain to you how, but that's what I started to see for the first time in my life. And here's the other thing I saw. 
Sunday after Sunday after Sunday or weekday, weekday masses from behind the ambo, instead of seeing pastors and associates, <laughs> that the, word, the prophetic voice behind the lectern, I saw what seemed to me to be a choking off of 2,000 years of truth. I saw a contraception, a, a cutting off of all those things that could help me and my family, you know, maybe a, a weekly holy hour or a family rosary, or maybe a, incorporating some asceticism or mortification in, or fasting in my life. Mary, was, Mary wasn't mentioned much. The need for me to get confession was not mentioned at all. Over and over again, rather than a bridge to take me to heaven, it was like a damning up of things. And I never really paid much mind to it. And, 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 and I kept thinking, why? <laughs> why wouldn't he take 2,000 years of sacred heirlooms, deposits of faith, and bring it to me, my family, the flock. And this thing kept rising in me as an old sports writer, an old writer. I've written books before. You know, it'd be, it'd be pretty cool if you could write priests to tell them what you thought, to tell them what you thirsted for. And I kept shooting it down because how arrogant of a, of, of a member of the laity to tell a priest how to be a priest. You know, it's presumptuous, it's judgmental, it's cocky, it's, it, I'm a sports writer. <laughs> you know, it's like, you have no right. And I shut it down. And then three, four months later, it would come back stronger. And it kept happening. Five years, six years, seven years, it kept rising. And then one day I said, no, <laughs> this census fidelium, it's got to be obliged. So I looked my brother, Danny, I work with three brothers and my father, I looked him in the eye and I said, hey, look, I'm going to give you eight month notice. I'm going to write a, I need a sabbatical. I want to write a book. Like, what are you talking about, man? We're busy. You can't, you can't write anything. Danny, I'm giving you eight month notice. What are you writing a book on? Uh, priests. No one's going to read that book. And I was like, yeah, you, you know, you're, you're probably right. But the Holy Spirit stuck it on me. So I started to write the book and I read all the paragons of our church. I read the life of John Vianney, Padre Pio, John Newman, Bosco, Neri, Colby, John Paul II. I read biographies. I wanted to find out what paragons did, not only to convert their villages and their parishes, but sometimes countrysides. Bosco, Vianney, countrysides. So I wrote about four chapters, five chapters. And the way it works in publishing is you sent these chapters off with a proposal to five, I guess it was eight or nine Catholic publishers. And about a month later, eight or nine Catholic publishers got back to me and they said, we don't want your book. Why? Because you can't tell a priest how to be a priest. Well, that's not, I don't, I'm not, that's not my thing. I, I, I'm, it's, it's for what I thirst. And like, yeah, we kind of get that, but we don't want your book. So what happens when you're a man and you provide for your family and you have a child that's about to go off to college and you have two other kids in Catholic schools and you're, and you're not providing for your wife and you think that you discern the Holy Spirit, right? You know, I had spent seven years kind of shutting it down and I thought I discerned it. And all of a sudden, what happens? Well, I'm the big fat loser who discerned incorrectly. Maybe, maybe the publishers were right. Maybe I am presumptuous and judgmental. Why in the world did I do this? So Satan comes in, right? And Satan makes it a chocolate mess. Thank God they put this bike path in front of my house, a brand new bike path. I used to walk it every day and I had this rosary and I knew if I tried to pray the rosary, I would lose, I would lose it on my first Hail Mary. The first of the 53 Hail Marys, I would just lose it. I wouldn't even be focusing on it. So all I did was I thumbed the beads over and over and over again, Mary, mother me now. Mary, mother me now. Mary, mother me now. And I come back home and I couldn't write because you can't write. When publishers tell you this on this side and your heart and zeal is on this side, well, what, what happens is there's a helicopter right here, right? And in every sentence you write, it's just kind of paralyzed. So I'd get up at five in the morning that's kind of my thing. And I'd write till like 12 or one and seven, eight hours, I would end up writing one or two sentences, three sentences. And they weren't any good anyway, because everything was a chocolate mess. 
So thank God across the street from my house was my former parish and they had holy hour. So I used to go into holy hour and I'd say, God, I got nothing. <laughs> I'm a mess. I, I don't have any prayers. I don't, you, you know it all anyway. I'm not even going to try, but I have your ear. I know I got your ear. So I used to go all the way up to the monstrance. There was the kneeler right in front of the monstrance. And I used to stick my hand on the base of the monstrance like it was the hemorrhage, like it was the hem of the garment. And I was the hemorrhaging woman. And all I did, all I tried to do was nothing except say, heal me now, Lord. Heal this thing now. I don't need words to write. I don't need any of that. I just need you to heal this thing in any way you want. Over and over and over again, show up at holy hour, shut it down. God, I got nothing. I'm going to stick my hand on your robe. Go home, try and write nothing. Something very providential happened. Finally, two people in the span of a week, a priest and a reporter from the National Catholic Register said, Kevin, you've got to see a priest named Father John Essef in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Who's John Essef? Don't worry about it. Just go see him. I know what you're trying to do. You need to see him. So I drove four hours out to Scranton, Pennsylvania, and I met Monsignor John Essef, a 92-year-old mystic, an exorcist. He received a bilocation from Padre Pio in 1959. He was Mother Teresa's counselor, confessor, and spiritual director for seven years overseas until Mother Teresa said, John, I know you think it's your charism and your ministry to serve the poor. It's not. It is yours to go back home to America and teach priests what it is to be holy. Form priests. So Monsignor S. obliged the saint and said, okay. So he went back to America and he started to travel from seminary to seminary to seminary all throughout the country. And what he saw was What he saw was seminarians that were not praying, seminarians that had no devotion to the Blessed Mother, and seminarians that had no devotion to the Eucharist. And he said, when you're anti-Marian and you're anti-prayer and you're anti-Eucharist, you're of the demonic. He saw seminaries, not all of them, but many seminaries throughout the country as the sick womb of Holy Mother Church, where if you were strong and intentional and you're a young man who desirous of becoming a saint and a holy priest, somehow maybe you're going to get aborted in the womb, in the seminary. You're going to be cast off or you would just leave. And if you're malformed in the womb, oftentimes you're going to get pushed forward. And he saw that a strong homosexual strain had been set free in seminaries. And when he approached rectors about it, his concerns, you know, he was very politely rebuffed. John, I appreciate your concerns, but you know, you're here to give retreats and, you know, we, we, we've got that part handled. We, we sense it, we're handling it. Which he sensed as a refusal to handle it. So what, Je what Monsignor Essef told me was, Kevin, you write this book. I was like, Monsignor Essef, no, <laughs> I can't write the book. I, I can't even write right now. Um, and, and no publishers want it anyway. Kevin, write the book. You've got to keep working on the book. I'll, I'll try it. Kevin, write the book because the seminarians that I saw back then in the 80s, they are today's priests. Write the book. So I went home, sat down at the desk, nothing. Two sentences, two bad sentences. And then two weeks later, on June 22nd, 2018, everything changed. The Washington Post broke a major story on Cardinal McCarrick. And then came the Pennsylvania grand jury reports. And then Carlos Viga in his 11 page letter saying that Pope Francis knew about McCarrick's indiscretions. And then all the scandals in Central America, et cetera, et cetera. And the publisher started to call back. You still working on the book? I said, yeah, I kind of, I guess. And then the president, the former president of EWTN called Dan Burke and he said, "Are you? I heard what you're doing. Can I see what you got? I said, oh, it's not much, but I'll, so I gave him what I 
had. And he called back the next day and said, I want, I want to publish your book. The book was published, released on August 15th, the Feast of the Assumption. After Dan Burke's phone call, I had 50,000 words to write. I had a deadline. When I sat down at the desk and started to write, Monday, 1,100 words, Tuesday, 1,400 words, Wednesday, 1,300 words, Thursday, same thing. You don't want to know why? <laughs> because God, Jesus, threw the book into my head at the holy hour. When I had nothing, when I was dead man walking, when I was Judean wilderness, when I had zippy, he was throwing the book into my soul, into my head. The book that I've written is really not by me. I think in a very real way, it's written by Christ. Mary, Mary, mother me now, well, go to my son. I went to his son. Jesus wrote the book. I cooperated. You know, you're on the back of a tiger ducking branches in a jungle to get the thing done. You know how it is. You just cooperate the best you can. Shortly after the book was released, it became one of the best-selling Catholic books in the country. And priests, again, not because of me, I'm just a sports writer, and priests from all over the world started to contact me. And, and, and generally, I'll, I'll sort of wrap it up here. Generally, this is what was said. One of the, one of the first um, priests to contact me was from England. And he wasn't even Catholic. He was an Anglican. And he said, Kevin, I have no idea how your book, The Priest We Need to Save the Church, ended up in my rectory. I'm over here on the shores of Walsingham. I'm not Catholic but I read your book in two nights. 20 years ago, I wanted to be like this Vianney that you write about. I wanted to be the one who walked into the community and tried to save souls, who was always praying. And that's who I was. I was in the chapel all the time. I was with families trying to help them. I was with the poor. I was that Vianney. And then my brethren started to poke fun at me. They said I smelled like incense. They called me a church mouse. They called me, oh, he's always caught up in that chapel. And I bought in and I took my foot off the accelerator and I became comfortable. I lost it. I read your book and it will never be the same. You have re-engineered my priesthood because you have asked me to die to my comforts. You have asked me to mortify all the things that I sort of want to get lazy with and sort of accept into my life. You've asked me to self-amputate all these things, and you laid out the blueprint of how to do it. Again, not me. The saint biography. <laughs> Christ in the holy hour. So Joseph Bishop Strickland, other bishops reached out, and, and I think the, how I like to wrap this up right here is this. The book, I believe, is more is for all of us. It's for me. It's, it's, it's sort of how to get to heaven, how to be holy as a Catholic today to get to heaven. I won't go into what I lay out. It's done through storytelling. Um, but I'll say this, as I'll give, I'll give you guys, you Fort Myers men, one walking order. That's all, just one, not two, not three. As it pertains to priests, especially right now, if you have sensed at mass recently or for years even, a reluctance or maybe a flat-footedness or a tepidity or even a cowardice for priests, your pastor, your associate, to proclaim the fullness of the Catholic faith on marriage, on abortion, on what it is to lead your family, your grandchildren, your children, your own self, through a sanctification of your life, through fast, through mortifications, through an intense prayer life, through a devotion to Mary and the rosary, through entering into the world to proclaim, not just through action, but through action and word, your Catholic faith. Sort of in the carpe diem mentality in aisle four of the Walgreens, where you sense someone sort of suffering and you go up to them, you're like, God, you know, I'm going to use the Holy Spirit now. If you sense reluctance in your pastor, 
to ask you to become a saint in this regard, I beg you guys, I beg you guys times 10, if you're not encouraging your pastor, maybe this is the way to do it. Hey, Father, I heard something today in the homily. Maybe something upset you in the homily. Maybe just it was just another one of these milk toast homilies, whatever. Maybe something was said that was just bordered her heresy. It's very charitably, but very boldly. You square your shoulders. You look him in the eye and say, Father, I love you. You know that. I pray for you. I love the priesthood. But in a certain way, Father, if you're not demonstrating for me how to become holy by your own life, then you're straightjacketing my holiness. Father, I look to you. And I sense it's in you, Father, but man, I'm not getting it. I'm just not getting it. And I know it's in you. Father, help me to be holy, especially in this day and age, because it's tough. And if you're not courageous, Father, then you know what? I'm not going to be very courageous, or at least I'm going to lack it somewhat. So Fort Myers crowd, I, I, I beg this, and I say this only for one reason. I've done, I've done this in all charity. I'm from a family of priests. My brother's a priest. I, 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 I count among my friends, I don't know, 12 to 15 close friends, priests. Priests like it. They might not like it, but if it pokes their conscience and if, if it's presented well, you can help. The voice of the lady, as Archbishop Sheen said in, 90, in 92, who's going to save the church? Not the bishops. Not the priest. Who's going to save the church? The intentional member of the Catholic laity. So when the priest sees you guys looking earnestly in their eye and begging them to bring, lead you to holiness, I think change can happen. And let's face it, guys, I think we need change in this world today. So with that said, guys, I appreciate you listening.